Amen. Thank you. What a way to start off. Welcome to Lakeside Presbyterian Church this morning. We are so glad you are here. Uh, if you are a first-time visitor, and I know there is one because I invited him, uh, and then I told Poncho because, I don't know if you've noticed, Poncho says every Sunday, did you invite anyone this morning? And so we have a gift bag just for you. And inside the gift bag, there's lots of information about the church and all those things you need to know. But most importantly, there is a cookie. So make sure you get the gift bag, Bill. Uh, and anyone else who might be joining us for the first time. Uh, also, if you would like to and you have not yet, we would love for you to sign up for our emails. Uh, you can see Norm, Mr. Communication back there, and he will um, get, the, get you on that list, and you can find out all the goings-on of the church. Also, the prayer requests, there are, sh there are forms out in the narthex that you can fill out and put in the offering or give to Elise over there who compiles those, and uh, so we can stay current with one another and what's going on. Praise reports are good, too. Uh, this week we have going on the Wednesday morning at 10, right here in the sanctuary, the Bible study with Pastor Carolyn, and we would love to see you all there, and just come as you are. You don't have to have been here for the last 47 weeks with her. Uh, just be here. Um, we would also love for you to join us immediately after the service in the Narthex for a cookie time with our Spanish-speaking congregation. We've been meeting with them and fellowshipping with them, and I don't know about you all, but I've met some new people and been able to practice my horrible Spanish. So join us and do that. Uh, there will not be choir practice this Friday for anybody who was thinking about showing up on Friday morning. Uh, that will not be happening, just so you know. And if you notice the lovely flowers that are here this morning, they are in honor of Tom and Kathy Zyrell's 54th wedding anniversary. <laughs> Congratulations, and beautiful flowers. Uh, is anybody heading north of the border this week to take mail? Okay, you can see Rick after the service if you've got mail going. Is that U.S. or Canada? U.S., okay. Uh, our, but you bet he can take Canada. To, he is an all-purpose man. So, uh, so if you've got mail, be sure and see him. Let's... Um, Remember why it is that we're really here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank him that we get together in his house on Sunday mornings. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that we have with you. We, we just honor and worship your name. You are the exalted one, and we just uh, thank you that we get to come before your presence. Turn our hearts towards you, Lord. Turn our minds that might be racing with all of our activities and to-do lists still our minds and turn them toward your holy name and your holy word which we get to hear this morning and as we as we gather here we just um that you would just prepare our hearts to worship and we'll just take a moment of silence before you lord we know father that you love us and that jesus christ our lord is alive and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, also now and forever. In your mercy, Lord, enable us to share in Jesus' obedience to your will and in the victory of his resurrection. Help us to express our love for you here as this morning, but also as we go out this week. And we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Our scriptural call to worship this morning is from Psalm 100 verses 1 and 2. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Please stand and sing our first song of worship and praise this morning.
please remain standing for our responsive reading. The responsive reading today is from Psalm 16, and please join me in the bold face type. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure. You make known to me the path of life, and you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal measures and your right pleasures in your right hand. You may be seated. <laughs> Our first reading this morning is from 1 Kings. The Lord said to Elijah, Anoint Elisha, son of Snaphat, from Abel Meholah to succeed you as a prophet. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I'll come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and give to the people. Then he sat, set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. This is the word of the Lord. You may remain seated for our next song. Our second reading is from Galatians. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit 
and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with passion and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Reading this morning from Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Uh, you may be seated. Now we'll have our pastoral prayer. Would you bow with me? Our gracious God, you are good, you are holy. You are different than us, but you are very near to us. And we thank you so much for all the perfect gifts that you've given to us, for the gift of life, for Jesus that came into the world to die for our sins, for the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, we thank you so much for our families. God, we are grateful for this church family, and we pray that you might bless each one of us. Let us work each day making you Lord more and more, and help us to be obedient unto you. Help us to perfectly follow your will in everything in life. God, we offer you today all that we are and all that we have. We pray that you might use us, that your name might be glorified around the world, Give us a burden for those that do not know you. Help us to reach out to those that are in need and in poverty. We pray for the members of our congregation that have special needs today. Father, you know them. You know the ones that may not have the financial resources that they need. There are others that have difficulties within their families, those that have health problems. Lord, we pray that you might strengthen and uh, be with each one of us in a special way. Today we would make special mention of those within our congregation that have physical needs. We pray that Jane will regain all of her strength and she'll be strong again. We pray also for Cheryl Sundendahl that you might just guide her, strengthen her body. Be with Gary that the doctors can find out what his problem is and we pray God that he will start gaining weight again. And Lord, now we pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for our next song, And Can It Be? standing for the uh, Nicene Creed, and would you uh, repeat it with me? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, 
light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let me start with a personal note. I bring you greetings from Robert uh, Jordan and Skip Wiener and from Dean Hansen and Lynn Hansen. I just was visiting with them the last couple of weeks and oh my goodness, they love you guys so much and they all asked about every one of you <laughs> and, and I gave them the best answers I could. But um, they just wanted me to share that with you. Well, we are now in the book of Job in our series of ongoing Bible books. Job, wow. Now, every Christian has been confronted by the question, how can a good and all-powerful God allow suffering? Now, no answer you can give will satisfy everyone, of course, but the book of Job does give God's answer to that question. So in our book, our key word is suffering, and our key verse is Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. This is not a historical book. It is a story about a man named Job, who we believe lived around 2000 um, BC, around the time of the patriarchs. And he lived in a land far away from where Abraham and his children ended up living. He did not have the benefit of God's revelation to Abraham or to Moses or to the prophets. So that's a little different. Job is considered part of the wisdom literature of the Bible, like Proverbs, like Ecclesiastes. And much of it is written in poetry, which is kind of cool. Most of us know the story of Job, so I'm not going to go into great detail about the story, but it begins with a description of the man. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Then the text goes on to describe how Job regularly sacrificed to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is called Yahweh in this book. He even sacrificed on behalf of his children, just in case they had sinned. The scene after this shifts to heaven and a dialogue between God and Satan. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Now, did you notice how God set Job up? Job was rich and respected. He was righteous and religious, and it makes no sense that he would suffer calamity if God were truly good. 
Yet God points out to Satan, unprovoked, have you considered my servant Job? We'll get back to that. Satan says, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to his face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well, then. Everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. God allowed Satan to attack Job, apparently to show Satan that he was completely wrong. There was a series of catastrophic events. Job lost all of his great wealth, experienced the loss of his 10 children and all of his servants, and it happened boom, 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 like that. In spite of these terrible events, though, Job did still worship the Lord. Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. That's as a sign of mourning. Then he fell to the ground in worship, and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Wow. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Well, Satan and the Lord get back together and have another conversation, and Satan says, Well, he's still got his health. If, you, uh, if he doesn't have his health, he will curse you. And the Lord said, okay, you may do that. You can't kill him. Satan did take away Job's health, inflicting him with a horrible disease. But in all of this, Job remained true to the Lord. Three of Job's friends heard about these events and came to see Job. They had three rounds of speeches each. The three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, discussed the reason for Job's condition. They reasoned that truly righteous people aren't punished by God. Only wicked men are. Therefore, since God was clearly punishing Job, he must not be truly righteous, but guilty of a secret sin. They encouraged Job to confess his sinfulness and be restored by God. Job responded to these three friends by protesting his innocence and rebuking his friends for not giving him either answers or comfort. But Job particularly wanted to face God. He says, even today, my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. There, the upright can establish their innocence before him, and there I would be delivered forever from my judge. Job knows that he would be found innocent if he could defend himself before God. Then a younger man, named Elihu, appeared and discussed his observation of Job's situation and the reasonings of all the three friends. Elijah, Elihu rebuked Job for justifying himself before God, but he also rebuked Job's friends for talking a great deal but exhibiting no wisdom. Elihu pointed out that suffering can be for instruction rather than for punishment. Well, at the end of Elihu's speech, Job has been asking for a hearing in front of God, and at last, God spoke. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand marked off its dimensions. Surely you know. God is being sarcastic here. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while all the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? 
The Lord challenges Job to stand up and answer some very compelling questions about his own human status as opposed to God's divine power and glory. Let me warn you here that if the meaning of the book of Job is supposed to be about suffering and divine justice, then truly God doesn't give an answer. The Lord nowhere explains generally why the innocent suffer or even why Job himself is suffering. But if the meaning of this book is about our relationship with God, as I believe it is, and is exactly what that story about um, God talking to Satan and those questions and answers there, then God's speeches do provide an answer. Who is it, oops, going back, who is it that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Job simply doesn't understand the divine plan that lies behind the whole universe, not just his own life. Obscuring God's plans happens when we speak about what's on God's mind, what God intends, why things happen the way they do. But we, we have no clue. And yet we love to speak on God's behalf, don't we? Like Job's friends. Job quickly learned how great God is and how insignificant he was. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. God's questions here aren't rhetorical. He really wants an answer from Job. And then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Job's response was one of submission and surrender. God didn't explain to Job why he suffered. God simply wanted Job to trust him and bow before him. And then God goes on. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? Can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. Look at all who are proud. Bring them low. Look at all who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked where they stand. Bury them all in the dust together. Shroud their faces in the grave. Then I myself will admit to you that your own right hand can save you. You want to be God, God says? Go for it. If you can humble the proud, you do that. If you can slay all the wicked, go. But of course, Job cannot. Both Job and his friends were utterly baffled by God's freedom to do everything anything, anything he wanted. The friends assumed that suffering was always and only a sign of God's punishment. And Job could imagine no other worthy divine purpose to his unmerited suffering. But our God is free. He's free to work his surprises any way he wants. God isn't required to do the things that we want him to do, nor is he required to do things the way we expect him to. And he isn't required to explain himself to us. God is free. He is free to enter into Satan's test and tell none of the participants about it before or after the fact. God is free not to answer Job's impudent questions and also not to agree with Job's pious friends. God is also free to care enough to confront Job and to eventually forgive his friends. God isn't bound by our concerns. He doesn't have to act the way our conceptions would require him to do. What God does springs freely from his will. There are no guidelines that he has to conform to. He chose to create and to sustain the universe, to govern time itself. God may work by the order and pattern spelled out in Deuteronomy or in Proverbs, or he may transcend those bounds, as he does in Job. When we say, No, God can't work that way. It makes no sense. 
That's our own pride speaking. Let me say this plainly, we are not God. And I'm sorry, if you want an explanation for why God works the way he does, I wish I could give it, but I'm not smart enough for that. I don't know, no one does, only God. A lesson in this is that we also find our freedom only to the degree that we acknowledge God's. Nothing is more frustrating and restricting and frankly upsetting than to set up rules for God and then wonder why he doesn't follow them. And here's God's answer to that, which we just read. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? We don't understand God's justice many times. We can't possibly. It's above our pay grade. We are not God. However, we either trust him or we rebel. Not really any middle ground here. And Job tro chose to trust. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you will answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job never did succumb to the temptation of Satan to curse God. So why does he have to repent? Well, his repentance isn't of sins that was demanded by his friends, but the repentance of insufficient knowledge of God. And that's the challenge the Lord gave Job in the beginning of his speech. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Job passed that test of faith given by Satan. And the thrust, let's note, of Satan's strategy was not to lure Job into acts of secondary sin, such as immorality or dishonesty or violence, but to tempt him to the ultimate sin, disloyalty to God. Before God ever spoke, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. He never, ever cursed God. Loyalty and trust are the essence of biblical righteousness. Righteousness has more to do with relationship than with following the rules. Let me say that again. Righteousness has more to do with relationship than with following the rules. You can follow all the rules and still have no relationship with God. And all of us who do have a relationship with God at times fail to follow all the rules. That's what we think of as sin and unrighteousness. But in fact, trust in God equals righteousness. Satan went after Job's relationship to God. Job passed that test of loyalty and earned full marks, despite his protests, his doubts, his complaints, and his challenges. Let me note that the general pattern of God's justice does remain. Good deeds mostly do bring benefits, and bad deeds almost always bring harm. This principle, however, is not absolute. Forces and powers, both earthly and heavenly, interrupt this cause and effect sequence. Sometimes the wicked prosper and live a long life, and sometimes the righteous suffer. Only God's final justice will, judgment will bring justice to all, and even in that case, we may not understand. Christians also get asked, how can a good God send a good person to hell? Well, God is the only one who gets to judge who is good and who is not. And remember, righteousness is about relationship more than about following rules. We don't know who's going to hell. We cannot judge someone else's heart. Only God can. He gets to set the criteria. And at Judgment Day, if we're confused by who's in and who's out, that's our misunderstanding. That's not injustice. Going back to suffering, since the righteous may suffer and the wicked prosper, we can't judge anyone of secret sin or praise the prosperous as righteous. Pain, hardship, tragedy doesn't mean you must bear guilt or doubt your relationship with God. Virtually all of us will have suffering in our lives and will be required to either accept God's freedom to do whatever he wills or to rebel. The book of Job lets us know that when we decide God is unfair, we've made idols of ourselves. 
and have diminished God. When we decide we are smarter than God, God will allow us to live in our error. But remember, Anselm's argument for the existence of God, if you took philosophy 101, his definition of God is that being than which none greater can be imagined. I love that. That's so backwards sounding. But God is the greatest possible being that you can imagine. We tend to think we're that being. In the conclusion of the book of Job, God severely rebuked the friends of Job because they misrepresented him, something we must be careful not to do. And the story ends with Job being restored to health, receiving twice the, the wealth he originally had, and once again being blessed with ten children. This wasn't Job's reward for passing the test. This was God's grace, freely given. Maybe things have happened in your own life that you wanted to happen, and other things happened that you didn't want to happen, that caused you suffering. Maybe you've buried someone you loved more than you love yourself. Maybe you've gotten a new job. Maybe you've endured the death of your parents. Maybe you've birthed babies. Maybe you've lost a job that you really liked or that you really needed. Maybe you finalized a divorce. Maybe you announced an engagement. Maybe you've been ill and in chronic pain, like Job. Some of these things you would choose, and some you would not. Some of these things made you happy, and some of these things made you miserable. And yet, here's the thing. No matter what your feelings, God was still present and righteous in all of it. I promise. And not just the stuff that felt good, but also the stuff that felt awful. Because God's presence with us and love for us simply cannot be judged on the basis of how things feel to us at the time. This has taken me my whole life to learn. But how I feel is never an indication of how God is doing at his job. Have you considered my servant Job? Is a good question for all of us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Carolyn. I may have to go back and watch that one. Uh, <laughs> that was so good. Uh, we're going to transition now to our time of giving of our tithes and offerings. And um, we have the privilege to partner with God to serve our community here at Lakeside. And so let's give freely and generously of what he has given to us. Let's pray together. Generous God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, we present these gifts to you. They're symbols of the work that you have given us to do. They're symbols of the fruit of our hands, of our labor. And we just bless you. And we just ask that you take these tithes and these offerings and turn around and bless others through these, through these monetary donations, Lord, that your kingdom would be lifted high, that your name would be lifted high and um, through this giving. And we just ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the doxology.
You may be seated. We now come to our time of communion, where we share together in the body and blood of Jesus in recognition of his great sacrifice for us. Here at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, we practice open communion. All baptized believers in Jesus Christ may share at this table, but this is not to be taken lightly. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about partaking in this communion, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty against sinning, of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. And so now as we prepare to come to the table of the Lord, let us confess our sins against God and against our neighbor. God, forgive us. Our communion table is not always visible to the world. Sometimes we allow threats to enter into the church, making it hard to see that we are your community. We act as though we don't need each other. We act like we don't love one another. We do not know and bear one another's burdens. We fail to build each other up. We do not always give ourselves willingly and joyfully to one another. Forgive us, Lord, and strengthen us so that we may live in the unity that you grant us. Forgive us, Lord, where we have failed to um, speak when you've asked us to and where we have um, spoken when you wanted us to remain silent. Now, Lord, as each of us, in the silence of our hearts, confess to you our own sins. In your great mercy, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments, now and forever, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. By Christ's work, we are reconciled and united with God and with one another. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen. Some instructions for us. After the words of institution, the ushers will release the rows one at a time, starting at the back, to come down the center aisle. Once you have received the elements, go back down the side aisles to return to your seat. If you are unable to come forward, we will bring the elements to you immediately after others have been served. As a sign that we take this communion as a celebration of our personal relationship with Jesus, please eat the bread immediately after you receive it. As a sign that we also share in this communion as the community that is the body of Christ, please take the cup back to your seat with you, and we will all drink together after everyone has been served. You know, God needs absolutely nothing from us, but he wants our love, he wants our appreciation, and he wants our worship. And I know that without the sacrifice of Jesus, his body and his blood, that we would have absolutely no hope when death comes to us. It seems very little to us to ask that during communion or the Lord's Supper, that we focus on just what the greatness of these actions mean for us. In the beginning, God created us for himself. But even though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and death, God in his infinite mercy, his grace, his love, he sent his only begotten son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to live among us. He suffered every hardship, every adversity, every trial, trouble, and temptation that we face, except without sin. And finally, he stretched out his arms upon the cross in perfect obedience to the will of the Father and offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. On the night in which he was betrayed, 
our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he gave it to his, <coughs> excuse me, his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had blessed it, he said, Drink this, all of you. This is my body of the new, my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. But whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Therefore, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we eat the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming his death until he comes again. Will the elders and the ushers kindly come forward? Thank you.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take and feed on them in your hearts by faith and to thanksgiving. Let's participate by drinking the cup together. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for allowing us to gather and share these moments together. Thank you for giving us the time to connect with heaven and to hear your promises. And thank you for allowing us to join together as brothers and sisters. We pray that we will continue to grow in our love for you through each day of our lives. Amen. Please stand and join us in our final hymn. Benediction is not a prayer, it's a blessing. By the authority that Christ gave to the church, today we bless you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face to you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may God's blessing be with you and your family this week. Don't forget to join us for cookies.